right. Good morning, everybody. Good to be with you guys again. All right. Um, today we're going to uh, <clears throat> look at Second Chronicles. Um, and I'm going to read for us the passage there, but in a bit. Um, but by way of introduction, um, <clears throat> there's a movie that came out back in 2005. I know it's a long time ago, um, but that kind of struck a chord with me. It's called The Weatherman. I don't know if you ever heard of that. Yeah, you know, okay, The Weatherman is with Nicolas Cage. Um, it's about a grown-up man who struggles with his sense of self and accepting um, the hardships of adulthood, right? And at one point, his father says to him, uh, played by Michael Caine, he says, do you know that the harder thing to do and the right thing to do are usually the same thing? Nothing that has meaning is easy. Easy does not enter into grown-up life. So that quote has stuck with me over the years. Uh, I kind of just think about it every once in a while um, because it's, it's simply true, right? Uh, easy does not really enter into adult life. Of course, um, there are seasons that are easier than others, right? But, but life is not about taking it easy, um, though that's what many of us want. Right? We, we, we want that. We work for retirement, generally speaking. Many of us, we work in order to play. Um, for some of us, our central pursuit in life is recreation and fun. For some, right? Um, a life without problems. A life with no hardship. A life without suffering. And this, of course, is not possible uh, for everyone uh, here who has lived life, right? Um, but we do the best that we can uh, to avoid hardship and to make life easier. And to some extent, this is actually good. This is actually a good thing, right? Because why should we intentionally make things harder for ourselves when there's an easier way? And that's the general purpose of technology, right? Uh, from the wheel to the smartphone. Like, that's the general purpose of it all, to make things a little bit easier for us. Um, but there are aspects of life that will never be a full bed of roses um, all the time. Okay, so relationships, for example. Right? Because we all have sin, right, marked by fear, marked by insecurity and pride and self-centeredness, it is inevitable that our relationships will come to points of friction along the way. It's just, it's not, it's not, you can't avoid it. But also with different various situations of life, whether with work or with school or with money or with the general progress of our lives, we run into roadblocks, right? We run into setbacks. We run into frustrations, failures, and overall struggles. Okay, it's just a part of how things go. And so life is hard. And sometimes, sometimes we go through a season full of setbacks where one hardship is followed by another. And just like it seems like it's never going to stop. We get hit by the same thing time and time again. And sometimes in those seasons, you just want a break, right? You know what I'm talking about. You just, and I need a, I need a break from this. Um, and when I say a break, I'm not necessarily talking about a vacation, okay? Because we need vacations in life, no doubt about it. But the kind of break that I'm talking about is sometimes you just want to cheat, you want to cheat in life a little bit. Sometimes you want to cheat in your spirituality just a little bit, right? Um, just, just cut me a break. And so what do we do? We engage in some of our vices, right? Um, we fulfill our flesh a little bit because, you know what, I deserve a break. Um, we take shortcuts. We lean on insecure entities like money, right? We worship other gods, to put it in biblical terms. It's just so much easier to cheat on life a little bit, to cheat on faith, and to indulge just for a little bit, right? It's, it's an easy out. But sometimes that little bit turns into something more enduring. So today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, King Asa, A-S-A, King Asa of Judah. 
every year um, I read through <coughs> uh, the, the book of Kings and Chronicles and uh, First and Second Chronicles. You know, it never gets old um, because it chronicles the lives of the kings, okay, the kings of Judah in particular. It tells their story. It tells their successes and their failures, their fallibility and their faith, and it's constantly speaking into my life as I read it. And so just as kind of a brief historical review to help us get the context of this passage that I'm going to read in a bit, <clears throat> Israel was a single united kingdom under David and Solomon, okay, one single kingdom. But after Solomon died, that kingdom split into the northern kingdom, which had the majority of the 12 tribes, 10 out of 12, and they were simply called Israel. And then you had the southern kingdom, uh, which was comprised mainly of Judah, the tribe of Judah, also the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, so you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And as a whole, from the perspective of other nations, the northern and the southern kingdoms were simply understood as Israel. Okay, um, so it can get a little confusing, confusing because there's national Israel and then there's the northern kingdom Israel, right? Um, it's kind of like saying Washington, right? What is Washington? Well, there's Washington, D.C. proper and then there's Washington, the general area. It's kind of like that. Um, and so uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, however, that was primary. Okay, Judah was primary for a few reasons. First of all, uh, that's where Jerusalem was, the capital city. Um, and then there was David, who was from the tribe of Judah. And David was the, the king that everybody remembers. He's the one who set up the whole kingdom, basically, united, united everything. Um, and uh, subsequently, the son of David is our Messiah, our Lord and Savior Jesus, right? Coming out from his, uh, his lineage. Um, and then the kingdom of Judah, generally speaking, generally was more faithful to the Lord than the northern kingdom Israel, okay? Um, and so I want to share with you the story of King Asa in Second Chronicles, <clears throat> chapter 14 through 16, okay? So it's a little bit of a long reading. Uh, it's three chapters. They're not three long chapters, but they're three chapters, and it's a story, so um, stories kind of keep our attention. So, um, all right, so King Asa, he was the great grandson of Solomon, okay? So keep that in mind. So starting chapter 14, verse 2, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars in the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asher poles. So these are all like um, different figurines and idols that Israel had put up to worship other gods uh, since the time of David. Right? Um, verse 4, he commanded Judah, the tribe, his people, to seek the Lord the God of their ancestors, and to obey his laws and commands. He removed the high places and incense altars in every town in Judah, and the kingdom was at peace under him. He built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. Verse 7, Let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. Asa had an army of 300,000 men from Judah, equipped with large shields and uh, with spears, and then 280,000 men from Benjamin, armed with small shields and with bows. And all these were brave fighting men. Verse 9. Zerah the Cushite, okay, Cush, which is part of uh, north eastern Africa, okay? Zerah the Cushite marched out against them with an army of thousands upon thousands and 300 chariots and came as far as Marisha. Asa went out to meet him, and they took up battle positions in the valley of Zephatha near Marisha. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. And the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled, and Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. Such a great number of Cushites fell that they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. The men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. 
They destroyed all the villages around Gerar, for the terror of the Lord had fallen on them. They looted all these villages since there was much plunder there. They also attacked the camps of the herders and carried off droves of sheep and cattle, uh, and goats and camels. Then they returned to Jerusalem. Verse 15. The Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you. and The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God. This is Ezra, he's, he's, uh, he's still speaking here. For a long time, Israel was out without the true God, without a priest to teach it, without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, and one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. So when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded, the prophet, he took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Then he assembled all Judah and Jerusalem, uh, Judah and Benjamin, and the people from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who had settled among them, because some of the tribes, they decided to leave and to join Judah. For large numbers had come over to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. They assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. And at that time, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had brought back. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were to be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. They took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting, with trumpets and horns. And all Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. King Asa also deposed his grandmother, Makha, from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asura. Asa cut it down, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places from Israel in the northern kingdom, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. There was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. In the, chapter 16, in the 36th year of Asa's reign, Basha, king of Israel, the northern kingdom, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah, which was a border city, okay, to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asa, king of Judah. Asa then took the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and out of his own palace and sent it to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. Let there be a treaty between me and you, he said, as there was between my father and your father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad agreed with King Asa and sent the commanders of his forces against the towns of Israel, the northern kingdom. And they conquered Ijan, Dan, and Abel Maim, and all the store cities of Naphtali. When Basha, king of the nor northern kingdom, heard this, he stopped building Ramah, that border city, and abandoned his work. Then King Asa brought all the men of Judah, and they carried away from Ramah the stones and timber Basha had been using. And with them he built up Geba and Mizpah. Verse 7, at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from your hand. Were not the Cushites and the Libyans a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? Yet when you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. That was from chapter 14. Verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. You've done a foolish thing. 
And from now on, you will be at war. Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was so enraged that he put him in prison. At the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. The events of Asa's reign from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. Then in the 41st year of his reign, Asa died and rested with his ancestors. They buried him in the tomb that he had cut out for himself in the city of David. They laid him on a bier covered with spices and various blended perfumes, and they made a huge fire in his honor. All right. The word of the Lord. When you read about the kings of Judah, um, you see some that start off great and end off bad. Uh, you see some who start off bad and end up kind of good. You see some who start off bad and end bad. <laughs> um, but none of them are completely good and bad the whole time. Or I'm sorry, none of them are completely good the whole time. Okay? Not one, not a single one. Asa is one who started off great and ended badly. And his is the plot line that I worry about the most uh, because I see it happen so often. Uh, if you just follow Christian news, I mean, you just hear about the tumble of so many pastors, right? It's just like, I don't want this to happen to me. I don't want this to happen to any of us, right? David, King David was similar. You couldn't ask for a better beginning than David, right? Anointed as the youngest of eight sons, slayer of a giant, all the women of the country sing about you, uh, victor over all your enemies, you become king, you're promised by God that your kingdom will last forever. And then he, he commits adultery and he commits murder and everything goes downhill from there. And barely, there's just barely recovery in, in David's life. Start off great, ended rather badly. So Asa, he started off great. In chapter 14, uh, in the earlier part of Asa's kingship, he wins this great victory against Zerah the Cushite because of his prayer and his dependence on God. Right? So uh, just chapter 14, verse 11 again. Then Asa came to the Lord his God and he said, Lord, there's no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. And right after that, in the beginning of chapter 15, this guy, Azariah, this prophet, he gives uh, King Asa this prophetic word in, in verse 2 of chapter 15. He says, the Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Profound, truthful words, right? And th this first part especially is something that I pray uh, very often, right? The Lord is with you when you are with him. So my prayer is, Lord, where are we? Lord, where are we? Am I with you right now? Are you with me? Right? And of course, the Spirit is always with us in a sense, but like, are we really together in this? Whatever is going on. But the second part of this verse here, this word, it echoes the famous words of Jeremiah 29, verse 13, which you might be familiar with, which says, you will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Right? Very famous, very powerful words given to Asa in the, in the good times of Asa's reign. Okay? Um, and after this, Asa proceeds to clean out Judah and Jerusalem by getting rid of all the idols. And he leads the people to devote themselves to the Lord. But at the end of Asa's kingship, in his 36th year as king. He faced another battle, this time with the northern kingdom, Israel. And here, instead of praying, instead of depending on God, what does he do? He makes a treaty. He makes a treaty with the enemy nation, Aram, who lives to the north of the northern kingdom. So on the other side, right? By making a treaty with Aram, Asa was getting them to invade 
the northern kingdom of Israel so that Israel would withdraw from Judah, withdraw their attack, and it worked. But this becomes the end and the fall of Asa. And here, another famous verse, another great quote is given, this time by the prophet Hanani in chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Right? These are very powerful words, and I'm sure you, you probably may have heard a sermon on this or a devotional on this uh, in some form or, or another, but the Lord is always looking whose hearts are fully committed to him. Right? He's just looking throughout the earth. He says, oh, that one, I'm going to strengthen that heart. Right? That's like amazing if you think about that, right? Well, I, wanna, I want that. You know? <laughs> Strengthen my heart, please, because I need it. You know? um, but this verse comes in the context of a rebuke. That, you know, it's right there, right? Where God speaks through Hanani to Asa, basically saying, hey, why didn't you trust me like you did before with the Cushites? I came through for you then, but now you turn to the Arameans for help? And the rest of that verse, okay, that was just part one of the verse. The second part of the verse says you've done a foolish thing, and from now on you will be at war. And then later, Asa contracts a severe foot disease, and he dies. And all that time, Asa never repents. He never turns back to the Lord. So what, what happened to Asa? What happened to this guy? So good, yet so, and then he turned all so bad. Like, what happened? Now, Scripture's not clear about it. It doesn't tell us exactly what happened in his mind and his heart. But we can be sure about what was lacking based on the two verses that I just highlighted. And it's three ways of saying the same thing. He was no longer with God. He stopped seeking God with all his heart, and his heart was no longer fully committed to the Lord. Okay? He was no longer with God. He stopped seeking God with all his heart, and his heart was no longer fully committed to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but I just need to look at my own life, and I see that this is all too common. Right? When was the last time you sought after God with all your heart. I still get from God. <laughs> you know, now, you might be doing it right now. You know, so I'm not saying any, nobody's doing this, right? Um, but maybe for some of us, like, when was the last time you sought after God with all your heart, right? Is your heart fully committed to him? Now, as I say this, I'm not merely talking about emotions, Right? Uh, like, like an emotional, like, oh, Lord, I love you. You know, like, and it's okay to raise your hands and sing expressively, but that's not all that I'm talking about, right? But the engagement of your will, of your mind, your heart, your soul, the, which affects your desires, right? On the flip side, it is so easy to seek after things that fulfill our flesh, right? It's so easy to be fully committed to things that fulfill our flesh. Like good food and wine. Like I love good food, right? And sometimes we can pursue that <laughs> with all our heart, right? Um, making ourselves look better. Sometimes we can pursue that with all our heart. Media consumption. Sometimes we pursue that with everything that we have, right? Money. That's an easy one. We pursue that with, like, Everything, right? Security. We pursue that with everything, right? But there are also things that are not considered fleshly, per se, like friendships and relationships with family. Like these good things that we pursue, that we should pursue, that we need to pursue, right? But these things that we seek after, are they a substitute are they a replacement for seeking God? In other words, are we satisfied with these things 
of life in such a way that as long as we have all of these things, but don't have much of God, we're okay with it. As long as, you know, I come to church, it's enough. Right? But all this other stuff, I'm going to seek it with all my heart. God, he saved me. I'm good. I don't need to seek him anymore. Maybe. Maybe. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And I find it very interesting that these words were spoken to Asa near the end of his life. Early in his life, what was the word? The word was, the Lord is with you if you're with him. Seek him, right? Late in life, the word is, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there is no letting up in the Christian life. There's no letting up in this life where you can just kind of sit back and relax in your faith. Uh, Put it another way, there is no vacation from God. You know what I'm talking about? Like, um, I I say this not as a boast in any way, but, you know, I do my quiet times relatively frequently, like pretty often, like I read the word every morning, generally speaking, right? But... Sometimes, when I go on vacation, I forget. I don't read the Bible. It's like, why would I stop just because I'm on vacation? What does that mean that I stopped? (laughs) you got to think about that, right? (laughs) So a paradigm shift needs to take place in the life of every believer if it hasn't taken place yet. And it is is the move from cart... Uh, compartmentalized faith, which I'll call, to God essence. Okay, I'm going to explain this. Compartmentalized faith to God essence. In compartmentalized faith, God is just a part of your life. Okay, he shows up on Sundays, or even every day just for your morning uh, devotional. But he's never the center. You're the center. Right? Right? Um, and everything revolves around you. Life is just about you. On the other hand, what I call God essence, because I can't really think of another term, um, God is the essence of your life, right? He is the center. He is everything. Without him, you can do nothing. Without him, you are nothing. He is essential to your existence and to the existence of all things. And it's something that you actually acknowledge. He is essential to the purpose and the meaning of life and to your life. And it's something that you recognize. I can't, I have no meaning without him. I can do nothing without him. That's God essence. If your life is characterized by this God essence, then you will always exemplify these verses that we're talking about here. You are one whose heart is fully committed to him, and he will strengthen you. But if your faith is compartmentalized, then it is quite likely that you will fall at some point and in some way similar to how Asa fell. Not the same way necessarily, but similar somehow. You will look to someone or you will look to something else to save you when you are in need. even though earlier in your life you sought after God to save you. And the reason you will do this is because God is not everything to you. He is not the essence of your life. Earlier I mentioned how different kings, they started and finished, uh, how they started and finished in life. I want to know how can we be ones who finish strong? How can we be ones who finish strong? Regardless of how we started, whether we started great in life or not so great, okay? Now, I know this question is going to feel more relevant for those of us who are in our 40s and 50s and up, Um, but even if you are in your 20s and 30s, or even as a teen, or even as children, right? 
it is important to set the orientation, the direction of your life rightly now. It's very important so that you don't end up like King Asa and other cautionary characters later in life. So how can we be ones who finish strong? Number one, turn to God. Very simple. There are many ways you can express this, but it is never too late to turn to God. Never. If you are not with God, whether you've never given yourself to follow after him, or you became a Christian years ago, but have kind of fallen away, or you just kind of like, you know, the dial has turned, turned down a little bit, and you're just kind of mediocre, feel a little bit lukewarm in faith, then turn your life over to him. Give yourself to the Lord. If you're living with compartmentalized faith, then make that Copernican shift. You know Copernicus, right? He's the guy who uh, basically discovered that the earth is not the center of the universe, right, where the sun and the stars revolve around the earth. Rather, the sun is the center of our solar system, and the earth revolves around the sun, right? It's that big shift in mentality. It's, hu it's a huge shift, the Copernican shift, okay? Uh, we need to make that Copernican shift by surrendering ourselves, yielding ourselves in faith to make God the essence of our lives, the center, now, if, like Asa, you started off great in your walk with God, but you have subsequently veered off course such that you are no longer fully committed to him, then you don't need to stay like Asa. You don't need to do that, right? Asa remained stubborn, verse six, chapter 16, verse 12. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord. So you can... Humble yourself. Now, for those of us who are older, you know this. As you get older, it can be harder to humble ourselves because we're more seasoned and experienced in life. I know things, right? And so sometimes it can be harder to humble ourselves. But we can still do this and cry out to the Lord. There's a story um, of a later king named Hezekiah in, in Chronicles and in Kings, um, Second Kings. He got sick to the point of death, and the prophet Isaiah even came to Hezekiah and told him that he was going to die. But in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 2 to 3, it says this, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, and he prayed to the Lord, Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion, and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And you know what happened? God literally made Isaiah turn around. As he's like, basically, like he's walking out of the palace. He turns around and he tells Hezekiah that God's going to add 15 years to your life because God heard his prayer and saw his tears. So God never, he never, never, never turns a deaf ear to anybody who truly turns to him. And this is the remarkable, forgiving, merciful, and gracious character of of our God. He will always take us in when we truly turn to him. Okay? He may not give you 15 years like he gave Hezekiah. There's no guarantee about that. It's all a different story for each one of us. But the second thing um, that I want to point out here in terms of how we can be ones who finish strong is don't run from suffering. Don't run from suffering. Don't fear suffering. If an easy life is what you are after, then you will naturally run from suffering, which will lead you away from Jesus. Okay, let me say that again. This is, this is and I'm going to talk about this. If an easy life is what you're after, then you will naturally run away from suffering, which will lead you away from Jesus. Okay? Um, this is part of the problem of modern people generally speaking, we spend our whole lives trying to run away from suffering, right? With ourselves at the center, such that we don't know how to handle suffering when it comes. But suffering is the unavoidable reality of life. In some shape or form, it's going to find you. And you will experience it. The question is, will you run away from it, 
try to avoid it at all costs, only to let it catch up to you and destroy maybe a significant part of your life and maybe even destroy your life itself? Or will you choose to follow Jesus knowing that suffering comes when we follow him? And of course, not run away from that particular suffering. So I'm going to talk about this. Because if you follow Jesus, you must go through suffering as well. Did you know that? If you follow him, you must go through suffering. He went through it, and his followers must go through it as well. The difference between the suffering that comes from following Christ versus suffering that catches up to you is that the suffering that comes from following Christ will always release life to others. Whereas suffering that catches up to you because you've been running away from it generally only brings pain. But as a word of comfort, if you are in this latter situation where you've been running away from it, if you turn back to God, he can still redeem that suffering. A great example of the former, okay, a great example of those who do suffer for Christ are martyrs, right? Uh, martyrs who lay down their lives literally. They die for Christ and his kingdom. They always release life into the very communities who take their lives in some form or another. You read many missionary stories. People who, you know, Jim Elliott's one of the famous ones, right? Um, they go into these hard places. They lay down their lives. They're literally killed by, you know, the tribes or whoever, right? And it releases life. And salvation comes to the village, to the nation, right? Um, if you go through the list of all the 12 apostles, as well as Apostle Paul, they all suffered at the very end of their lives. You know, uh, Peter is one of the famous examples. He was hung on a cross, but upside down, right? Um, they suffer at the end of their lives, but they don't suffer in a King Asa kind of way. Not at all. Asa suffered because of his lack of trust in God. That caught up to him, and there was only pain in his life at the end. The apostles suffered because they were following Christ. And this released life into their communities, into nations, and subsequent generations that would change the historical and present world as we know it. Do not be afraid to suffer for Christ and for his kingdom, for standing for kingdom righteousness and kingdom peace. And as I say this, kingdom righteousness and kingdom peace, you need to discern the difference between kingdom and social. Okay? Social justice falls under kingdom righteousness. It can fall under kingdom righteousness, but not everything that social justice stands for is necessarily equated to kingdom righteousness. Necessarily. Okay? You have to discern that. I'll let Pastor Ed talk to you about stuff like that. Um, but doing what is good and right, even if it costs you your reputation, even if it costs you your money, even if it costs you your left hand, standing for kingdom righteousness, for what is good and right in the kingdom. When you suffer for these reasons, for these causes, you share in the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. That's Philippians chapter 3. Paul talks about that. This is fellowship with Jesus. This, in large part, is what it means for us to be with him and for him to be with us when we suffer together with him for his causes. But so many of us run from this often without knowing it because we're conditioned by the current, by the streams of this world to run away from it. We are conditioned to devote our lives in the opposite direction non-suffering, just flesh comfort. That's it, right? And because we do, if we do, we don't have true fellowship with Christ. Partial, maybe a little bit, but true fellowship with Christ. We don't want to go through what he went through. We don't want to follow him. We just want to skip the suffering, right? Skip the cross and jump to resurrection. That's generally what we'd like to do. 
But it doesn't work like that. Life doesn't work like this. Easy doesn't enter into grown-up faith life. And so how do we finish strong? This is the conclusion. The bottom line answer to it all lies in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus finished his fully, his fully human earthly life with the cross, with suffering. He suffered because he chose the path that would lead him to suffer, knowing that it would release life for us. It didn't just catch up to him. The cross didn't just catch up to him as if he were running away from it, trying to be comfortable. So in the same way, I want to say to us all, do not let hardship and suffering choose you. Instead, you choose to follow Jesus into the life that builds up the kingdom of God along with the hardship and the suffering that's going to come with it. And then keep doing it. Keep doing it. Keep following the way of Christ. Don't choose the easy shortcuts. Keep at this and you will finish strong and you will finish well. It doesn't matter how you start in life. It only matters how you finish. Finish strong. Let's pray together.